speaker, Elizabeth Wyman. We're very fortunate to have Elizabeth with us today. She is the head of the Genetically Modified Organisms Unit at the European Food and Safety Authority. And uh, her unit supports the scientific panel on genetically modified organisms. Elizabeth's talk today will be on the role of the European Food and Safety Authority in the risk assessment of GMOs, and she will also discuss the agency's policy regarding independence from corporate influence. So please welcome Elizabeth. Thank you. It's uh, for me a one-day trip, but I had the chance to listen to you for about one and a half hours, and I have to say it was very interesting, with a good entertainment factor also. <laughs> so I'm not sure I can keep up to that level. I'm a little bit um, a fish out of the water here because I'm not a legal person at all. I'm a scientist. But the good news is that uh, EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, works in a legal framework, of course, and I will point that out uh, when I go a little bit through the presentation. So I am in a unit that deals with the risk assessment of genetically modified organisms, but EFSA as an organization has a risk assessment role that is much, much broader. So we also have animal health and welfare, plant health, contaminations, pesticides, and so on. So this is only one part of our remit. So, starting with uh, the remit of EFSA in the GMO area, I'd like to first uh, give you the definition of what, what a GMO is. It's an organism that is genetically modified if its genetic material has been changed in a way that does not occur under natural circumstances, under natural conditions, through crossbreeding or natural recombination. This is the definition in one of our legal texts, which is the European Union Directive 2001-18 EC. And if an organi organism falls under this definition, then it must have an authorization before it can enter the European market. We have, in fact, two frameworks that are our frame in which we perform the risk assessment. One is the set directive that I mentioned before, Directive 2001 EC, and the other one is Regulation 1829-2003. And the difference is that the directive covers the release into the environment of living genetically modified organisms, regardless of what the purpose is. The other one, Regulation 1829-2003, covers only genetically modified organisms for food and feed purposes. So the one, the left one is much broader than the right one. Most of our applications that we receive from applicant companies deal with genetically modified plants. There are some applications that deal with microorganisms, but the bulk is from plants. And what you see here is the typical scopes that we get. In the food area, this is the GMO itself for the food use, or uh, food containing or consisting of GMOs. For example, you could have here, oops, sorry, that was the wrong one. Corn on a cob. This is a typical GMO, it's um, for food use. Or food produced from a maize plant that is used uh, in the ingredients in the food chain. And the same type of definitions are available for feed. So it can either be the GMO that is used itself <coughs> for feed, the maize plant, for example, that you use, or a feed that is derived from the maize plant. And these two uses have in addition a third component which is called deliberate release into the environment. And that can happen if you just import the GMO, which is a very typical situation that you would have shipments that come in from uh, the uh, Americas, for example. But if there is still a living organism, organism like for example a maize kernel is still a living organism, this will already be considered deliberate release into the environment. So also for applications that are only for import and then processing in the EU, 
this is an uh, environmental risk assessment to be done. And of course, the, the much better known situation and widely debated is if you want to cultivate a GM plant in the EU, then of course it falls under this definition and needs to have an environmental risk assessment. What we do not do, and I would like to stress that right at the beginning, we do not authorize at all such, such applications. The authorization is done by the risk managers, which is the European Commission and the member states. So we stick only to the risk assessment. We are also not responsible for the legislation. So all these legal frames that we have have been drawn up by the risk managers, as I said, Commission and the member states. And we also do not do any quality controls. So all the monitoring activities, if there is compliance with the, uh, the rules for the input, for example, all this is done by the member states. So in EFSA, we work uh, together with external experts that do the risk assessment with us. And I would like to describe a little bit the system for you in the next couple of slides. We have uh, for the GMO area, the so-called GMO panel, which currently consists of 19 external experts. And these are the people that elaborate the guidance documents. Guidance documents <coughs> in the sense that we have, I think, very clear prescriptive uh, requirements on what types of scientific data we want to see when an application reaches our institution. And this is described in the guidance documents. And they also assess all the data that are in the dossier. And then we write what we call a scientific opinion. I would say it's a pretty big review that describes what we have. And then in the conclusions, we detailed whether or not there are any risks that have been identified. And this GMO panel is supported in this work by about 40 additional experts that we call ad hoc experts, which are organized in several working groups. And then from the unit, so from the EFSA staff, we have uh, 15 scientists that also support the whole process. How do we get uh, an adopted output, an opinion that will be forwarded to the risk managers for the further processing in an authorization? Eight times a year we have plenary meetings where the panel members come together. Actually the last one was yesterday and the day before yesterday, so I come directly from one, from one of them. And we discuss the opinions and then the, a vote is taken. And we need to have in the room at least two-thirds of the members of the scientific panel, of the GMO panel in that case. And then we adopt with a simple majority. So if there is more than half of the panel members in favor of adoption of this opinion, then it will be considered finalized. These definitions are a little bit academic because we do not have situations where, let's say, nearly half of the panel members would be against and the other half for the adoption of an opinion. There are long discussions before the texts are finalized and typically <coughs> we have a consensus on that. The GMO panel members are appointed for a three-year term, and they are at the moment just in the middle of that, and it's due to expire in mid-2015. And we are right now looking for expressions of interest for the next panel. So this is a, a publicly available call on our webpage, and everybody who believes that he would fit, he or she would fit the profile can of course apply. And the main task for us then is to screen the scientific excellence, that this is a key criterion for us, so we need the CV, we need the publication list of the people, what work experience they have in the risk assessment, but also in a scientific discipline that's relevant for the GMO risk assessment. And then we have a, a selection procedure where CVs are evaluated, and uh, at the end, the successful candidates will be appointed for another three-year term, which will be start will, will be starting mid-July 2015. So if you feel 
you might uh, fit the bill, go to the web page, it has just opened the call. Now one very important part of this is, besides the scientific excellence, is the independency of the people. I don't know if you follow sometimes media coverage, but this is one of the topics that keeps coming back. How do you know that your scientific experts are really independent, that they are neither in favor of industry nor in favor of uh, parties that are against GMOs, for example, in our case. And we have uh, developed, I would say, a pretty sophisticated system that we call uh, the Declaration of Interest System, where we uh, ask people to declare their interests. Now, one thing is pretty clear. If you have worked in a scientific area for a long time, typically our experts are not youngsters, but they have a, a long career behind them, you will have had uh, exposure to various groups, you will have worked in various contexts, you will have developed interests. But an interest, per se, is not automatically a conflict of interest. But what we want to see from these people is that they explain and declare to us all the interests that might be relevant in the EFSA context. We have, in fact, an independency policy that covers not only the experts, but that covers the whole of EFSA, starting from the management board, the executive director, to all the scientists that work at EFSA, so we all declare our interests and we are screened. And there are three types of declarations of interests, and they are the, the three that are listed down here. One is the annual declaration of interest. It has to be done all the time. Every year they have to renew this, to have to update what they have been doing. And this is screened once a, once a year at least. The next step is before each meeting that happens, for each agenda item, they have again to declare whether or not they have a conflict of interest. And then at the beginning of the meeting, we ask again, is there anything that might influence you? Has anything happened on the, let's say, off chance that between the declaration of this specific interest before each meeting and the actual start of the meeting, something has happened? Somebody has, I don't know, bought, bought shares in a company that's relevant or so. Mm -hmm. What they have to declare is the list here. So we want to know economic interests, whether they are members of any managing bodies or equivalent structure, whether they are in scientific advisory bodies. We want to know their employment, for sure, whether they have consultancy links with anybody, not only industry, but it could be a consultancy for an NGO, it could be a consultancy for a public institution, everything. Research funding, intellectual property rights, memberships and affiliations, and anything else that didn't fall into these categories. And um, not everybody is super happy to go through this declaration procedure, so when we get new experts, you have to guide them through them to make them understand what we want to have. But I think people have learned to accept that this level of transparency is very important. And all the declarations of interest are also published on our webpage. So if you would be interested to learn who are these people that work in the GMO panel, you can go to the, to the webpage and uh, look up the declarations of interest. The screening is done uh, in, a, in a stepwise process. So first they have to declare the interest. Then uh, there is on my level, on the head of unit level, a first screening and then it's counter screened on the director's level. And the decision on whether or not they can participate in a meeting or in the work of EFSA, depending on, on if there is a big conflict, is taken uh, at the end of this procedure. And these are some facts and figures for the last year, what we have all screened. So we have screened uh, over 4,000 of these specific declarations of interest before the meeting. 
We have over 1,500 annual declarations of interest and over 36,000 meeting agenda items screened. So this is a huge work for all the people. Um, what was the outcome? In 168 cases, individual experts were not allowed to participate in individual agenda items because of some potential conflict. And we have rejected about 80 of the annual declarations which means that these people cannot work with EFSA at all. So if they have a rejected annual declaration, this is the termination of the work for EFSA. I would like to explain very briefly our work on the applications and give you a bit of an insight in the numbers and uh, what we have on our table to risk assess and a bit also in the workflow. Uh, we receive most of our applications under the legal framework 1829-2003, which deals with genetically modified food and feed. And typically, as I said, it's genetically modified plants. The application actually comes to us via a member state, which simply means that the applicant files a dossier that contains all the data with the member state and the member state forwards this dossier to EFSA so there is no other step that the member state does at that point in time. When we receive the application we uh, submit uh, it to a completeness check to see if all the elements are present and then we start a consultation phase with member state experts. This is this yellow box here, consultation with all member states via the GMO EFSA net. We have more than 200 partner organizations all around Europe. And uh, these partner organizations have dedicated experts that look at the dossier and that send comments to us on all aspects. If such an application is not only for import and processing, but if the intention of the application is to grow such a plant, to cultivate it in the EU, then actually the first step is here in this left box. This is that a member state performs the environmental risk assessment, meaning the risk assessment to look for risks to the environment if this plant is put out. And I have pointed out here that we had in the UK uh, competent authority working with us on one of these cases. And uh, I have not mentioned, but maybe I should, we have three British panel members and the chair of our panel is a uh, UK citizen, Joe Perry. So the United Kingdom works with us very closely, I have to say. So all these um, comments and all the, the scientific work is then performed within EFSA. And we have an output, the scientific opinion, which is adopted by the panel. And then our role is basically finalized. We deliver that output to the European Commission, which makes a public consultation. So it's not us, but it's the European Commission that has a public consultation on the output. And then the European Commission formulates a draft decision, which is put forward to the member states for a vote for authorization. And I don't know if you follow this, but typically what happens is that when the member states vote in the first uh, level, in the first comitology level, they cannot reach any qualified majority. So there is no outcome, neither for nor against the authorization. And then this goes into a second phase. Uh, at the moment, this is called the appeal committee, where again member state uh, representative sits. On the outcome is exactly the same no qualified vote for or against it. And then it goes back to the European Commission in such a situation. And the European Commission takes a decision in line with what was written in this draft decision. And typically the draft decision will be in line with the EFSA outcome. This is uh, the normal procedure so far. Maybe we just look a little bit here at this uh, last part. Uh, we have so far had 144 applications that were submitted to EFSA. We have finalized 76 of those. 
and this was under the legal framework 1829-2003, and much less was submitted under this other legal framework 2001-18. You can see in the beginning it was a bit more, but then the applicants decided to use the other framework because it's more convenient to them from the procedural aspects. Um, we have also quite a bit of applications that are withdrawn by the companies during the risk assessment procedure. So I think we, I noted here 2023 20, and two under the other procedure. So meaning that overall we have approximately 45 ongoing applications on our desk at the moment. So how do we do the risk assessment? We are not only just looking at the data, but we have very clear standards which are in our guidance. And I'm not going into the details here, but there are some main principles that we need to observe. We are science-based. We operate in a step-by-step -step principle. We operate in the comparative approach, and we go case by case. Um, I will skip because I see I'm getting out of time what the comparative approach is. Um, maybe I would like to spend the last few minutes on my last point, which is, which I have been asked for, uh, to explain a little bit the stakeholder participation in the whole procedure. And this is very important, in particular when we develop the guidance documents. We have public consultations on what we call a draft guidance document. So we develop a first draft, it's put on the web page, and then everybody can comment on that. And we collect the comments and update the document then. We have also dedicated meetings during this procedure with various stakeholder groups, and at the end, when the guidance is finalized, there are info sessions that one can attend and be informed. Um, I have a small example here, which was a guidance document on environmental risk assessment that we have uh, finalized in 2010. And what you can see is that we had two rounds of stakeholder consultations, one before we even developed the draft guidance document and put it under public consultation, and then again another round before we had finalized the document. We have received in that about 500 comments, and this is quite typical, 500 to 700 comments on a document that we have to work into the final document. And there is a complete report available that lists all the comments on the web page. And what you can see here also is that the majority comes from the member states, which are our partners in the whole risk assessment and approximately equal amounts by industry, by other institutions, and by NGOs and environmental organizations. And the benefit, I think this is the, the most important uh, aspect of this, is that there is a shared understanding, not necessarily a shared complete acceptance, but at least an understanding what is in this guidance document and what are the principles. And there is this, the other part is there are instructions for the applicants that they know they have to adhere to when they submit the dossier. And when we do the risk assessment, we assess against the guidance document, which is then also displayed in the opinion to be transparent in the whole procedure. And I think this is the end, so I was very fast towards the end. Thank you. Uh, 
Olivia Hamlin, in UCL. Um, thank you very much for that insight into how EFSA works. Um, two very simple questions. Um, firstly, has um, an application for a GMO um, and under either of those instruments ever been rejected outright? And secondly, I'm wondering what, if any, preparations EFSA is making for um, uh, for dealing with synthetic biology when products of synthetic biology start to move towards marketing and commercialisation. Will that, will some of that come under the GMO uh, arm of EFSA or elsewhere, or has it been thought about? Thank you. Okay, thank you for the questions. To the first one, we have no means of rejecting applications. Oh, I meant throughout the whole process by the Commission in, in, in Council. Well, the typical outcome that I said is that usually they, can, they cannot decide on whether or not to authorize. So there's neither a rejection nor an approval in the voting procedure. And then in the end it goes back to the European Commission who decides in line with that draft decision. So for import and processing dossiers, meaning if we are thinking about plants growing elsewhere and then products or kernels or whatever coming into Europe, the European Commission has uh, authorized all this so far. Uh, for dossiers where cultivation was the aim, the strategy is slightly different. You might know there is only one authorized uh, GM currently growing in, in Europe. EFSA has finalized several opinions, but they are not being processed on the Commission level. So you could say for years opinions have been shelved uh, in a drawer and have not been moved forward through the system. There is a current case, and I don't know if you have heard about one GM where the company has actually taken legal action because the commission has not moved forward that dossier for, uh, I think, now eight years or something like that. And this case was in court, and the company got has now to move this forward and it was in a, in a vote at the council where also to my knowledge no qualified majority for or against was again reached and the final outcome is not available yet uh, possibly because there are European elections coming up so it may not be so ideal but uh, it's still pending the synthetic biology, um, the question whether or not that might become a part of the GMO regulation is not a question that EFSA decides. It's something that the European Commission and the member states do. They had a working group that was looking at a number of so-called new techniques. One of them is synthetic biology. And uh, no decision has been made in any direction. Um, so, as I understand it, then, your role is to conduct a risk assessment and you make recommendations, as it were, based on that, and then the member states decide. Exactly. Exactly that. I mean, the member states, they can include in their decision completely different factors than the risk assessment. We only provide the scientific part. They can use economic arguments, social arguments, political arguments, I mean, many different things. But uh, when EFSA came into force in, in 2002, when it was founded, this separation was found to be very important because there was a food crisis before, the BSE crisis, and uh, then the legislators wanted to make sure that the risk assessment is not influenced by risk management considerations. It's a principle. Thank you. Uh, can we have the gentleman at the back? Hi there. I was just wondering um, if you know anything about how the risk assessment process might change if the uh, free tr trade agreement currently being negotiated in Brussels between the US and the EU were to become a reality. Would it become more like the US process or, you know, I'm just wondering. I do not think that this can have any influence on the risk assessment process because this is legislation based. So 
in the in the one in the directive 2018, which deals with environmental risk assessment, the areas of concern that we have to address are written out, they are spelled out. So unless the legislator opens up this directive and rewrites the directive, we will do the exact same, uh, the exact same thing that we did before. And the same goes for the other regulation, where actually only half a year ago, the EFSA guidance document, the complete scientific content, has been lifted up into an implementing regulation. So what was a guidance document, we could say advice, to the industry and the risk assessors is now a legal text. So if anything were to change, all these legal texts need to be reopened. Um, and one final question, I think. Uh, Hugo? Thank you very much. Um, we'll have to move on to the next speaker now because we're short of time, but thank you very, very much. Hey everyone, I am very pleased to introduce our final speaker, Dr. John Broderick. John has kindly joined us today from the University of Manchester, a core partner of the UK's leading interdisciplinary Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research. His work specialising in emissions accounting, carbon trading, and the climate impact of energy systems has been published in academic and policy outlets, presented at the European Parliament, and cited by the House of Commons, Environmental Audit Committee, and the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology. So another scientist for us. With his wealth of expertise, we're delighted that John will be speaking on avoiding dangerous climate change on the basis of science and equity, the context and implications for emissions trading. With the recent UN IPCC report already referred to this morning, warning that limiting climate change and its effects would require substantial and sustained reductions of greenhouse gas emissions, this topic could not be more relevant. Without further ado, I welcome John for what promises to be an insightful and fascinating talk. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you for such a kind introduction, and thank you for the invite to be here. Uh, the Tyndall Centre is an interdisciplinary uh, research body. Um, we've got eight partners in the UK and uh, Fudan University in Shanghai, China. Uh, but I'm not sure that we've got any lawyers in our uh, organisation. So I'll be very interested to get your questions and uh, comments and feedback on this. Um, equally, I've never spoken at the close of a conference. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether this is going to be a, a graveyard shift or a grand finale. <laughs> I guess you'll have to decide by the end of that. Uh, so, so without further ado, here we go. So, um, let's start with the rhetoric around climate change. What are we talking about in terms of uh, our intentions in policy and in international agreements for how we would seek to mitigate uh, and adapt to climate change. The last uh, formally agreed UN FCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change document uh, that held any uh, structural weight was Copenhagen Accord. Um, and it included uh, international commitments to a fair contribution uh, for each of the signatory nations to hold the increase in global temperature below two degrees Celsius and take action to meet this objective consistent with the science and on the basis of equity. And this wording was reiterated by heads of state at their meeting in Camp David uh, in 2012 um, at, at the G8 
summit, and I'm afraid I didn't check uh, what happened at last year's G8, but this uh, language, this phrasing around keeping below two degrees and consistent with the science and on the basis of equity is something that crops up quite frequently uh, and seems to be kind of an, an eminently reasonable um, objective to set yourself in making climate change policy. And so it gets reflected in, in national policies as well. So here's a, some text from the UK's Low Carbon Transition Plan. Uh, the, the intention of this plan is to avoid the most dangerous impacts of climate change. Uh, average global temperatures rise. Uh, average global temperatures must rise no more than two degrees Celsius. And so this two degrees threshold um, isn't something that we have um, very uh, precise knowledge of from a scientific perspective, that we know that going from 1.9 degrees to 2.1 degrees increase leads to some um, singular and specific change, but rather it's um, a, a, an assessment of the concern from policymakers for the types of change that we would expect to see as we approach this thres threshold uh, from the findings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and their specific concerns that, that they, they produce a chapter about reasons for concern and try to assess the um, extent of climate change that leads to the extent of particular impacts that policymakers may be interested in. And also, it reflects on our, our historical understanding uh, of the uh, climate system, in that we don't have any analogue uh, with a good record beyond two degrees of warming. There, are certainly, there certainly have been warmer worlds, but they are in um, truly ancient history, millions of years ago. Um, and so we don't know quite exactly how the climate system responds past two degrees. Up to two degrees, we have a pretty good understanding. Past two degrees, we have um, a less good understanding. And so, so it seems prudent to set this two degrees as a target, uh, as a threshold, rather, against which we would try to avoid. So in climate positive, we talk about this as being our mitigation objective. And we want to ask this question, what are the emissions reductions that give us a good chance of staying below that two degrees threshold? And then the question for government and policymakers that I see is what are the policies that are best placed to achieve these reductions? So, how consistent are our, attention, our intentions at this policy level with uh, present emissions trends? And, and this is where we'll get back down to some of the some of the engineering reality or the accounting reality, the emissions accounting. If we look at the trend in uh, global CO2 emissions from fossil fuels and cement, so this is setting aside forestry and setting aside the other greenhouse gases. Um, the, it, it's these emissions that have the longest lifetime in the atmosphere and the ones that, that we have greatest control over. Uh, if we look uh, from the establishment of the IPCC in 1988, through to the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution report that started to set some um, numerical targets for the UK. Uh, Sir David King made this declaration that climate change was the most dangerous threat to humanity in 2005. We have the Copenhagen Accord that I spoke about in 2010. And then we have the Rio Earth Summit, Rio Plus 20 in uh, 2012. Have you, have you spotted what's uh, been happening with emissions here. There's, there's a certain gallows humour in our research group that Rio plus 20 is not so much Rio plus 20 years as Rio plus 20 gigatons of emissions. So essentially, global emissions having doubled over that period. Um, then we have a, a global economic downturn in the middle of there, um, the largest uh, global uh, economic uh, disruption since uh, the 1930s, and that made a a small blip in one year. And uh, yes, so we have this continuation uh, and we have an accumulation of gases in the atmosphere breaching 400 parts per million by volume uh, in 2013, the first time in several hundred thousand years. So we have a history of talk and a history of, of, of rising emissions. Uh, what might we expect of future emissions? Well, something that we do know about the energy system is that lots of the infrastructure that has a great influence over the quantities and the rates of emissions have very long lifespans. So we can expect business as usual to have a great deal of inertia and for uh, particular assets, for instance, uh, our power generation supply technologies, power stations, 
uh, large-scale infrastructures like roads, uh, airports, uh, and even the operational uh, equipment, aircraft and ships, having very long lifespans and giving us a reasonably good idea of where we're going in the short to medium term. And if we overlay our current mitigation plans in terms of the policies that have been put forward by national governments and industrial sectors, what we see is a very substantial rise in emissions continuing out to the middle of this century uh, and a quantity of emissions uh, that would be associated with a four to six degrees average temperature rise. Now what I should say is that the important thing to look at here are not the emissions in any given year, but the total quantity of emissions. CO2 is essentially a stock pollutant. When you release it to the atmosphere, it stays up there for many hundreds of years. You'd expect about half of emissions released today to still be in the atmosphere in about 500 years' time. Uh, and so you're, you're, you're adding. And, and what we discovered through the climate modelling is that the uh, parameter that uh, it correlates best with ultimate uh, climate change is the total quantity of emissions that you release over uh, the next century. And so that's the area under the curve that we're interested in. What would it look like if we were interested in giving ourselves an outside chance of two degrees Celsius? Well, it would look very different. We would have to go from an exponential rise to an exponential decrease, which is quite a, a, a kind of a, a, a stark realisation. And then further on that, what we see is because it's the total quantity of emissions in a time period that matters, the longer that you leave the point at which you peak and begin your decrease, for the same ultimate effect on the atmosphere, you would have to reduce at a steeper rate and to a greater extent. So what this is effectively saying is that if we'd started earlier, we would have a much slower rate of reduction. We would have a much more tractable problem. But every year that goes by and we leave it later and we build more infrastructure that locks ourselves in and we have also accumulated a greater quantity of emissions into the atmosphere, for the same climate change effect we are leaving ourselves with a more difficult problem in the future. So these are the scenarios that have been developed by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to help us to understand what degree of climate change we might expect. And the greatest uncertainty isn't the uncertainty in the climate system, it's the uncertainty in how we respond. If you look at these two lower scenarios here, uh, it doesn't matter what the terminology is, but they, they would give expected changes of 0.9 to 2.3 degrees rise, or 1.7 to 3.2. They are outside of the range of, of the highest scenario, which would give 3.2 to 5.4. And they describe very different futures that are plausible futures, um, but, but ones where the uncertainty is in how we respond and what our energy and agricultural and land use systems look like in the future. Um, and at present, if you look at our, kind of our data, we are just above the worst case scenario there. Okay, so um, just to kind of whiz you through what various kind of high profile commentators have said, uh, Fatih Birol, the uh, chief economist at that renowned uh, left-wing ecological think tank, the International Energy Agency, has uh, said that when I look at this, the, the CO2 data, the trend is perfectly in line with a temperature increase of 6 degrees Celsius, which would have devastating consequences for the planet. Uh, or more succinctly, according to the World Bank, at just 4 degrees Celsius, there will be water and food fights everywhere. So that is the, the, the likely implication of emissions trends today. So if you're interested in more of the expectation of these impacts, more of the detail on that, the IPCC Working Group 2 uh, that considers impacts uh, reported just last week, and uh, I'd recommend that you go to those documents. Um, so, uh, further bad news. Uh, we have inconsistencies from the global scale in policy terms down to uh, national policy scale. So I've already spoken about this um, uh, language of holding below two degrees must not rise uh, any more than two degrees Celsius. If we translate those qualitative statements into a quantitative probability, as the scientific community does in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports when making statements, uh, they would 
be associated with language or very unlikely to, exceptionally unlikely, chances of exceeding 2 degrees Celsius. In which case, that would correlate with a 10% chance or less. Uh, but despite this, the pathway that uh, we have in place in the UK is one of um, a 63% chance of exceeding 2 degrees Celsius. And that's not the only problematic consideration of the UK pathway. I'll go on to talk about how you share out the amount there. But what we have to realise is that, that this quantity of emissions that we have decided we would allow ourselves in the UK is over twice the size of that for a 10% chance, which would be associated with our commitments that we've made in international uh, fora. So, uh, yeah, so our legally binding carbon budget uh, is twice the size of our explicit international commitments. Uh, and this has substantial uh, policy implications, not least in energy policy and in uh, emissions trading policy. Uh, just to come back to that policy process, I put up here a letter um, that uh, our director at the Manchester Group, uh, Professor Kevin Anderson, uh, wrote to Jose Manuel Barroso, the um, President of the European Commission, um, in December last year. And he really kind of tried to uh, drive home the disparity uh, between those international statements and commitments and the actual policies that are being put forward. Uh, and this is available on his website, kevinanderson.info, if you, if you wish to read um, a bit more. So, I said that the UK budget was um, too large. It is also uh, based on an inequitable principle of effectively uh, equal implementation. There is the implicit assumption in the formulation of the UK budget that uh, India and China would peak their emissions uh, before or around 2020, which I'm sure many of you um, would see as a kind of an, in, an inequitable uh, position considering uh, ability uh, uh, and resources available to change your energy system and not least uh, historical responsibility for climate change. So in this paper um, that uh, Professor Anderson now Bose um, put out a couple of years ago, they looked at taking a budget that would give you a 37% chance of exceeding 2 degrees Celsius. So um, not that very unlikely chance, um, a reasonable chance of exceeding 2 degrees Celsius. And they said, what, what would be a uh, plausible allocation of emissions to non-annex one countries? So these are uh, developing nations, the global south, nations, nations without emissions targets at present. And so if you look at current rates of growth, and you allow them to continue out uh, for just another decade, and then you say that we would have reductions of 7% per annum, which is twice the rate that um, Stern considered was compatible with uh, economic growth. We have what would be regarded as quite a, a challenging scenario. And you say we will take that proportion, that quantity of emissions, out of the global budget, and we will say what is left for the Annex One nations, for those uh, developing OECD type countries and their energy systems. And what you're left with is, is, is essentially no emissions space. To, to carve out any space for us in the short term, we've left it so late to do anything about this problem that we have to make some inequitable apportionment or we have to substantially increase the probability of exceeding that threshold dangerous climate change. And so what if we did want to give ourselves um, a, a reasonable chance of avoiding two degrees Celsius rise? Well, we'd be looking at 10% emissions year on year. So 40% down from 1990 levels um, by next year. We're currently in the UK at about uh, 20 to 25%. We'd be looking at 70% by 2020 and 90% plus by 2030. We would be looking at a very uh, rapid and substantial transition 